All right, and now I'll open it up. Just give a minute and let everyone sign in. I can see the numbers going up. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the exciting bit, eh? When you see everybody <laughs> piling in. For those who are joining us, we're just waiting for everybody to get into the room and then uh, we'll get started. Okay, Claire, I think that's fairly steady yeah, now. Yeah, that's fine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending tonight. Um, we are, oh, got a message already. Yeah, it's just welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Messages already. Um, so, tonight um, is a webinar by Christine Woodcock, and it's on finding your Scottish ancestors in Canada. And it's held in conjunction with Lanarkshire Family History Society. Hi, Christine. How are you today? I'm good, Claire. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How's the weather in Canada? Uh, well, it's the first day we haven't had rain in about two oh, weeks. <laughs> we have had loads of rain today. It's what they would say in Scotland is drich. drich yeah. uh, you'll know what drich means. <laughs> um, so I think most of us ha have individuals in their family trees who left Scotland and moved to Canada for a better life. Uh, we've all probably dabbled in Canadian research trying to find out more about them. Personally, I've had a look at a couple of families and I also spend a lot of time looking at Canadians who served and lost their lives during World War II while serving with Bomber Command. Interestingly, by the middle of the war, the Canadian government decided they wanted their own concentrated group and formed number six group Bomber Command, which eventually had 15 squadron, squadrons under its control. Christine and I had an interesting chat a few days ago about being members of Lanarkshire Family History. How long have you been a member, Christine? You know, I've been trying to, uh, off and on, <laughs> because I forget when the, the renewal, that's, um, <laughs> but pro probably I would say close to 18 years. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I joined 15 or 16 years ago. Um, at the time, funnily enough, I didn't really have any family from Lanarkshire. But I thought, you know, it's a good way to learn a bit more, um, meet some like-minded people, use the facilities, go to talks, etc. But I think yeah. you've got you've got loads of family, haven't you? All of them. Australia? They're all, all of them from Lanarkshire. Lanarkshire. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually found some now, so I can justify being a member at Lanarkshire. Well, I have one. I have one odd branch that's from Tyree, but he eventually moved into Lanarkshire. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are spread out everywhere in Scotland. It's quite funny. Um, so most businesses and societies have sadly struggled during this current pandemic. And sadly, the Doors Open event, uh, which normally takes place in September of each year, had to be cancelled. Uh, Doors Open Day is a time when a lot of buildings, public buildings, societies, museums and other organisations open their doors to allow the public to access view collections and displays um, often freely. In light of this, I was asked by Lanarkshire Family History to make this available virtually for them. Um, and I, I know basically, I'm going to just give you a quick look at the, the video that I produced. It gives you a quick tour of the centre. Hopefully this will work for me, Christine. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thank you. 
Well worth the ten pound. I know. I mean, it's um, the cost of a lunch. It really is. I, I know. Really yeah, and you get so much for for that money. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it amazes me really. I mean, I think you were saying as well, Christine, that the, the cost of some of these societies in Canada is so much more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's almost ransom by com by comparison. You know, we're quite, just... I must be quite lucky in Scotland. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the Scottish people, but uh, there you go. Um, yeah. So before we move on to Christine's talk, I just want to let you all know that an emailed pack will be sent from Lanarkshire Family History over the next few days, and it will include a link um, of the recording of tonight's webinar. Don't panic. If you forget to write something down or your laptop battery runs out, it's fine, you'll get the link and you can basically catch up on it. And there'll, there'll be plenty of time uh, for questions at the end. There is a chat box just down at the <coughs> bottom. You can find a little chat bit. If you want to basically um, put your questions in there, we can have a look through them and Christine can look at, at answering some, some of them at the end. So I think we'll move on, Christine. Very good. Yeah. Um, you can also put questions in the uh, Q and A box as well, and we'll get grab them from there. Um, I will just ask for people to. Um, I I really like Zoom because it's very interactive with the chat. But I know that when watching a presentation, some people find it very very um, 
distracting to see the chat box pop up all the time. <clears throat> so try to keep that to a minimum. A absolutely use it for putting your questions in, but um, you know, to let people know what the weather's like where you are, we could probably wait till later. I always push this up on the wrong one. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> going to put my camera off just now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here we go. I'll right, we'll just flip that. Here we are. So we are going to talk about finding your Scottish ancestors in Canada. I just want to, for those who are not familiar with Zoom or the technology, uh, there's a floating toolbar. If you just move your mouse down towards the bottom of your screen, you will be able to see that and you will um, just pop your questions in there. Right, so I'm going to go back. Um, I just want to see if I'm still on screen, yeah? Yeah, let's do this. I'll just move, put this out so that that's not um, distracting you either. There we go. Okay, so it really, um, emigration to Canada really began in Newfoundland. Newfoundland is the closest part of Canada to uh, Great Britain, and it's really just a hop, skip, and a jump uh, across the Atlantic to Ireland. And that started really in the mid 1600s. Newfoundland offered seasonal work for Irish and English fishermen, and uh, thanks to the prolific cod stocks that were out there at the time. And some enterprising um, Scots from Glasgow decided that they were going to go out as well. So in the 1700s, Scottish merchants took advantage of these fishing communities that were already established in St. John's and the Avalon, Avalon Peninsula. They emigrated to Newfoundland and they set up shop. These men were um, primarily from Greenock and Glasgow. They were traders. They offered supplementary services to the fishermen. So things that fishermen would need in order to uh, be able to make it through a season. They were mercantile shop owners, they were jewelers, they were watchmakers. Later emigration brought professionals out and those would be doctors, lawyers, clergy, and teachers. There are not a whole lot of documents from that time frame that have survived. Uh, Canada didn't become a country until 200 years later. Uh, but what remaining documents are available, I would contact what it's called the rooms and it is the provincial archives for Newfoundland. And then we had military who came over. During the French and Indian Wars, the 42nd Regiment of Foot was sent to North America. They were involved in the surrender of Montreal in 1760, and they were involved in the early battles for the American Revolution. The 84th Regiment of Foot was raised in Prince Edward Island, uh, sorry, Prince Edward Province in, in New York from Scottish soldiers who had served in the Seven Years' War and who had stayed in America. This then meant that the 84th Regiment of Foot was one of the oldest regiments with some of the most experienced officers in North America. The 84th Regiment of Foot was key to protecting Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritime Provinces during the Revolutionary War. After the Revolutionary War, soldiers in uh, the Scottish regiments who had remained loyal to the Crown were granted land in Canada. The land grants were strategically placed all along the St. Lawrence Seaway, which borders much of the United States, and it covers an area of about 290 acres, 290,000 acres. The um, reason that it was placed along the St. Lawrence Seaway was if the Americans decided to come up and overtake Canada, that we, the Scottish soldiers were going to keep those at bay. Britain acquired the island of St. John from the French in 1763, and that was as a result of the Treaty of Paris. The Crown then parceled the land off into 67 lots of 200, I'm sorry, of 20,000 acres each. The lots were granted to 17 friends and supporters of the Crown for their loyalty and dedication to the King. The new landowners were supposed to settle the island, bring out uh, colonists, and pay quit rents to the government. However, most of them were notoriously absent landlords. 
So just some statistics for you. Between 1770 and 1815, some 15,000 Highland Scots came to Canada. Most of them settled on the East Coast in PEI and Nova Scotia, and a few came through to Upper Canada, which is now known as Ontario. The vast majority of them were Catholic, and they were almost exclusive, exclusively Gaelic speaking. In fact, Gaelic was the third most common language in Canada at that time. The Board of Trade initiated surveys to allow the British to exploit the region's potential for commerce, uh, in particular for fishing. The Board of Trade further recognized the need to mobilize settlers to clear, cultivate, and improve the lands adjacent to the waters in Prince Edward Island. The first of the land speculators, Sir James Montgomery, sent out about 60 settlers from Perthshire. The group arrived in May 1770. The next group came out in, from Dumfrieshire, and then in, uh, later in September of 1770, Robert Stewart and his family arrived, and they brought with them 60 families amounting to about 200 people who were from Argyle. The following fall, the group were joined by another 70 people who arrived under their own account. The largest settlement was organized by Captain John MacDonald of Glenalladale. He had become the eighth Laird of Glenalladale. He was dissatisfied with the situation in Scotland and he mortgaged his lands in Scotland to his cousin. And then he purchased lot 36 of St. John's Island from the Lord Advocate, St. James Montgomery. So St. John's Island is the name that was given to Prince Edward Island initially, and that was later changed to Prince Edward Island. In 1770, Colin MacDonald of Boisdale had begun to pressure his Catholic tenants on the island of South Uis to either convert to the Church of Scotland or vacate the property. So with support from the Roman Catholic Church, MacDonald gathered a group of 210 settlers, including 110 from the mainland, and they departed for St. John's Island in May of 1772. And they, the group are called the Glenalladale Settlers. And this book was put out by the um, Prince Edward Island uh, Scottish Society, a Scottish and Historical Society a couple of years ago, and it is absolutely worth getting. Uh, you can get get it through the PEI uh, SSHS, just Google that and you will come up with them. And they, um, it's really just a genealogical um, goldmine because it really just lines the families up um, and it gives lots of biographical information about the Glenalladale settlers. Um, you can also get the book at islandregister.com. One of the people who purchased land was Tommy Douglas, the fifth, uh, fifth Earl of Selkirk. Tommy was the seventh son of the fourth Earl of Selkirk, and he attended the University of Edinburgh, uh, studying to become a lawyer. While he was there, he noticed that poor Scottish crofters were being displaced by their landlords. Seeing their plight, he investigated ways he could help to find them find new land in the British colonies. Upon the death of his surviving brother, and then his father, he became the Earl. With the unexpected inheritance, he used the money and his political connections to purchase land and settle poor Scottish farmers in Belfast, Prince Edward Island in 1803. They came on three ships. The first, the Polly, brought 400 passengers from Skye. The Dykes brought 200 passengers from Mull, as well as Lord Selkirk himself. And the Otten brought 40 to 50 passengers from Uist. A later ship, three years later, the Spencer, uh, came with people from Collinsey and Orensey. His first settlement was in Belfast, Prince Edward Island. Each family was given 200 acres of land at a subsidized cost. Each farm had access to the water. The Highlanders worked as a community to clear the land and build their homes and their barns. And you know, I often think about them coming over and they would have come from the highlands of Scotland, you know, which is open, uh, rocky. Um, and then they arrive in the east coast of, of Canada and it is forests. <laughs> uh, most of them probably never swung an ax in their life. And so it's one thing to say, you know, you're going to come and you're going to get land, but here you are, you have to clear that land first. The passenger reconstruction list for the ship Polly, as well as for the ship Dykes, can be found on islandregister.com. 
There is a handout, by the way, and that will be sent out uh, by Claire following the presentation, and that will come with the packages for uh, regarding membership for the Lanarkshire Family History Society. Timber suited for the construction of ship masts was on land that belonged to the Crown and that was set aside for the use of the Royal Navy. The land was off limits for settlement, but by the mid 1700s, the government changed their policy to allow large land grants uh, to associations and individuals who would agree if they brought settlers in. Clyde merchants began hauling timber from Nova Scotia in the early 1790s. Their trade in oak and pine flourished during the Napoleonic Wars. In 1806, a stiff terrace was placed on Baltic timber, thus making the timber trade in Canada much more essential. With ships traveling relatively empty to Canada, the shippers began to advertise for passengers, and that resulted in two-way trade, right? They had passengers or settlers coming on their westward journey, drop them off, and then load up with timber and head back east to Scotland. Fur trader and explorer Simon Fraser oversaw the migration of 650 Catholic Highland Scots from the Clan Ranald estate to his land at Pictou, Nova Scotia. The settlers were in very poor state upon their arrival, and there was fear that they actually may move to South Carolina. The Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, John Parr, personally took this group of people under his wing and they paid, he paid for their provisions for the first year. Scott's recruiting agent, John Ross, advertised for settlers in Scottish newspapers, offering land on easy terms and passage to America at three pounds, five shillings per adult. Most who accepted the offer came from Loch Room in Ross and adjacent areas of Sutherland. The immigrants were looking to flee from the high rents and bad harvests and were not particularly poor. Ross offered a year's worth of supplies to them when they arrived, and that, but those provisions never actually materialized. In total, about 189 people boarded the Hector from two, two different points in Scotland, 179 at Loch Broom, and another 10 from Greenock. And there is a very good BBC documentary uh, on the Hector. I think it's Neil Oliver that, um, that is the narrator for that. But it really is um, very good if you get the opportunity to watch it. So relevant records for people from the Hector are at shiphectordescendants.ca. They're also avail available at McCullough House. So their website is haggis.mcculloughcenter.ca. And then the passenger list for the Hector is again available at shiphector.ca. In 1799, a contingent of McNeils from Barra arrived in Pictou, eventually settling in Cape Breton. This began a rather large influx of emigrants from Barra. They're actually still affectionately known. McNeil is a huge name down in Cape Breton, as is McDonald. And uh, they're still affectionately known as the Barra McNeils down there. And there's actually a singing group called the Barra McNeils. So relevant, rec rec relevant records for people who settled in Nova Scotia is the provincial archives, archivesnovascotia.ca. Then we had the Hudson's Bay Company, which was incorporated on May 2nd, 1670. The Hudson's Bay Company was a London-based company. And this charter allowed them sole trade and commerce throughout Rupert's land. This is Rupert's land. So all the yellow there is Rupert's land. And it is what is now known as Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, parts of Yukon and parts of the Northwest Territories. The HBC began recruiting in Orkney in 1702. They appointed local merchant David Geddes to be their recruiting agent in Stromness. By 1799, three quarters of the men who were at York Factory on the Hudson's Bay were actually from Orkney. Beginning in 1800, the HBC began recruiting in Lewis and Harris. Uh, the 
what I absolutely, I, I mean, I love mainland Orkney, but what I really like about Stromness is when you're walking along uh, the street just up from, um, from the pier, they have these fabulous blue plaques that really explain the history. And the building is still there that was used by uh, the various recruiting agents from the Hudson's Bay Company. When the men signed on, it, provided, it uh, prevented them from being pressed into the Navy. They were indentured to Hudson's Bay Company for three to five years. They were paid anywhere from eight to 20 pounds a year, depending on their rank and their experience. Officers, chief traders, and clerks were given an additional two, two pounds for uh, tea and sugar. The men were supplied with housing, food, and clothing. No women were allowed. And because of that, and they were gone for three to five years, they weren't allowed to take their wives or their girlfriends. Uh, they weren't, um, no women were hired by the Hudson's Bay Company. And so the men wound up being there for that length of time. They coupled with the Cree women. The children produced from that, those relationships gave rise to the Métis Nation in Canada. One employee, John Fabister, signed a three-year contract with the Hudson's Bay Company in Stromness in 1806, agreeing to work for eight pounds a year. He sailed aboard the Prince of Wales, and he worked at Moose Factory, Fort Albany, and Martin Falls. Martin Falls is now uh, in what is known as North Dakota. He took unwell, and he begged to take shelter with fur trader Alexander Henry. Alexander Henry was with the rival company, the Northwest Company. So he obviously wasn't feeling well if he wanted to go and take rest with uh, a rival. On December the 27th, John gave birth to a son, revealing that John was in fact Isabel and had been in disguise. The company was not impressed with the ploy. And so after her identity was discovered, she was relegated to being a washerwoman. She was unable to stay once her tenure was up. Now she had been a very good worker. She had pulled her weight. She had traveled without complaint. Um, she was part of the team and she really was very, a very good worker. But regardless, because she was female, she was not allowed to stay when her tenure was up. And so she returned to Stromness. We can see here in um, the company's records, uh, this is an appointment and service. It, is for um, Isabel Gunn or John Fubister. Uh, and it says that they came out on the Prince of Wales to, Moose, to Moosonee and then to Albany. They worked as a laborer. Uh, she traveled to uh, Henley House, to Martin Falls, to Pembina in the, in the fall. She gave birth to a boy at Pembina in the Northwest Company House, left for Albany via Martin Falls uh, with Hugh Henney. She was then relegated to being a washerwoman. She was discharged since we cannot think of keeping the woman any longer as she is of a bad character and has not answered the intentions for which she was detained. Isabel and her son were sent home on the Prince of Wales. Um, and then we see in 1821, uh, she was living with a James Scarth and a Nellie Craig. Then she was living on Helly Hole Street as a stocking knitter. And honestly, Helly Hole Street is very well named. I drove down that and it just about killed me. Uh, and then she was living on Main Street South and working as a stocking and knitting maker. She died in 1861. And then the records from um, the NRS uh, corroborate that. And you can see that she actually died a pauper, which is quite sad, really. Orcadian men were specifically recruited by the Hudson's Bay Company to build York boats. These boats were based on a Viking design. They were long, they were flat bottomed, and that made them easy to beach or launch off of a sandbar. And it was really good for the inland waterways. In addition, they could carry three tons of goods at a time, which was about twice or three times as much as the other boats. And we think of the, the um, Hudson's Bay Company as being in uh, you know, Manitoba or Northern Ontario. But in fact, you can see from this list that they had posts right throughout Canada. There's not a province there that isn't listed. In 
I had said before about the Northwest Company, this was the rival company to the Hudson's Bay Company. Remember that the Hudson's Bay Company's charter allowed them sole trade, right? So there really shouldn't have been any competition. The Northwest Company was founded by Highland Scots, uh, some of whom were loyalists, and they had migrated up from probably New York into Montreal after 1760. Their labor force were primarily French Canadians uh, or French who were residing in the Montreal area, but the men all wintered in Rupert's land. So they went out for the winter to do their trapping uh, and they stayed there for the entire winter. While they were there, again, because they weren't allowed to have women, they coupled with Cree women. And we will see the French part of the Métis nation from these uh, relationships. The Northwest Company created a strong tie between the Northwest and the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Northwest in that uh, sentence being the Northwest of Canada. In 1811, Hudson's Bay Company was struggling a little bit financially, and so they agreed to sell a huge portion of their land to the Earl of Selkirk. Remember, he was the one who brought people in to Prince Edward Island in uh, 1803. The landmass that the Hudson's Bay Company sold to him was five times the size of Scotland at 116,000 square miles, and it was all along the Assiniboine River. It included what is now North Dakota and Minnesota, but primarily it was in Manitoba. The Selkirk settlers were indentured to the Hudson's Bay Company for three years. So that was part of the agreement of sale that they would sell him the land and in return, he would provide manpower. Each settler was given a hundred acre lot uh, at a subsidized rate by Lord Selkirk. So relevant records for the Hudson's Bay land tenures can be found on a website called Canadiana Online. However, selling that uh, settlement, the Red River Settlement, created some big problems with the Northwest Company. Remember, they're the rival company. And the reason it caused problems was that the Red River Settlement straddled the trading routes for the Northwest Company. As well, the forts for the Northwest Company were on land that had been sold to Selkirk. So now suddenly he's their landlord. And probably the most important part, he was clearing the land for settlement, but by doing so, he was disrupting animal habitats and those habitats were vital to the fur trade. There was a bitter relationship between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company, bitter relationship between Selkirk and the Northwest Company, and the Crown was asked to intervene. The colonial office really just wanted peace and harmony and said, you know what, just figure it out. The partnership for the Northwest Company leaders was due to expire in 1821. And so there was an act of parliament which granted exclusive trade to the Hudson's Bay Company and the partners of the Northwest Company. So what happened was the two part uh, companies formed a coalition to become one. They used the name, the charter and the privileges of the Hudson's Bay Country Company and that prov provided a foundation for the future. In addition, because the partners were able to um, be amalgamated into the new company, it brought skills and experience uh, and those men strengthened the company and broadened their scope going forward. Court proceedings. Uh, this is just a, a, an example of what is in there. With the amalgamation with the Northwest Company, the Hudson's Bay then extended their territory with outposts in the Pacific Northwest all along the Columbia watershed because those posts had already belonged to the Northwest Company. That included the Puget Sound Agricultural Company, which was incorporated in 1839. It was the first example really of corporate farming. They had two farms, one provided beef and grain, the other uh, provided lumber. And this really provided supplements to the workers that were working in the fur trade. The idea was that the Puget Sound Agricultural Company was meant to be arm's length from the Hudson's Bay Company. But 
it was only officers, the officers for the Puget Sound Agricultural Company were also HBC officers. The Puget Sound Company purchased all of their livestock from the HBC. Anybody who wanted to buy stock in the company, they had to be an officer or a director of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, so you can see that it really wasn't arm's length at all. There were two large farms, as I said, one for livestock called Nisqually and the other one for grain called Cowlitz. So the PSAC had posts in Washington State, Alaska, Dakotas, Carol, uh, California, and even in Hawaii. Relevant research for the Hudson's Bay Company, all of their records have been placed on deposit with the Manitoba Archives, so that's the Provincial Archives in Manitoba. They have been digitized and some of those are available online, but not all of them. This is an example of a worker contract uh, and you can see um, there's actually three people here. So one is um, was from Bercy, the other was uh, from England and the third from Stromness. It shows what they worked at and then it shows how much they were paid. Employee and service, uh, employment and service records are available and that's the very same as the one that we just saw for uh, Isabel Gunn. This is another one. This is a man whose father had worked for the Hudson's Bay Company and he also uh, was applying to work and he wound up working as uh, at Norway House as an apprentice clerk. There are records of the officers available through the BC archives and you can see it's quite extensive for each officer. Also at the BC archives are um, some uh, photographs. So you can see on here, uh, it's really quite an extensive collection of photographs um, and it will tell you what they are. And then you can click on the hyperlink to actually see the photograph. The minute books uh, for the Joint Indian Reserve Commission uh, correspondence for them uh, and their reports and maps are available through the University of British Columbia archives. And the collection specifically is the JIRC or the Joint Indian Reserve Commission. Remember that the Hudson's Bay Company started out as uh, a London based company. And so the National Archives also has a wealth of records. Uh, probably uh, copies were kept in each country. Uh, these are all on microfilm. There is a website called Red River Ancestry, and it is a fabulous website for anybody who has an ancestor who lived in the Red River settlement. Uh, it has an ancestor index, it's alphabetical listing, and then hyperlinks on each person will provide more detailed information. By 1866, the Crown was starting to have negotiations to have Rupert's land returned to them so that it could be included in the new Dominion of Canada. The Hudson's Bay Company surrendered Rupert's land back to the Canadian government on December the 1st, 1869. The British Crown officially transferred Rupert's land and the Northwest uh, Territory to Canada in 1870. The lands comprised present-day Manitoba, most of Saskatchewan, Southern Alberta, Southern Nunavut, and Northern parts of Ontario and Quebec. If you have ancestors who work for the Hudson's Bay Company um, out in the Red River area or your ancestors settled in the Red River area, it is quite possible that you have Métis ancestors. The Métis were originally referred to, uh, it, it was the name given to mixed ancestry children of Scottish men and Cree women, or the French traders and native women who were born on the Red River settlement. Uh, there was a, a court case that uh, allowed this to be um, brought in as one of the standing nations of uh, First Nations people in Canada. 
on the 1901 census, um, there is a column, I believe it's column five, and that will help you to identify whether or not your ancestor is native. If it has an R in there, it means that they are, it's, a, it's short for red, uh, and that would refer to um, a native. And you can see that most of those are R with the bottom three being W for white. Part of the settlement, uh, part, part of having Rupert's land return to um, the crown was it displaced a whole bunch of natives. Um, so the Manitoba Act uh, was brought about and it um, basically meant that each Métis, Métis family was given a certificate saying they owned a piece of land. So it granted 1.4 million acres for the benefit of the families of the half-breed residents, those being the Métis. So the, they were given, the Métis were given what is called scrip. So it was a certificate uh, that would allow them X number of acres of land. And that came in denominations of 20. So they might get 20 acres of land, they might get 60 acres of land, they might get 80 acres, 120 acres, 160 acres, uh, just depending on, I guess, the size of their family or their status. The scrip were limited to the Lake Winnipeg and Mackenzie River basins because it had to do with settling the West. So if your ancestor was French Canadian, you will not find them through the Métis script because they were in the East and this had to do with settling the West. Script was given to the Métis heads of the household living in Manitoba and parts of the former Northwest Territories. People living outside of the area were not awarded script system because it was a system concerned with the settlement of the West. They could also get money script. So if they chose not to have the land, then they could go ahead and have uh, a dollar equivalent. So if they were granted 40 acres of land and they had a script for 40, then they could turn that in for $40. And it actually caused huge problems because the land that they were being given was not where the Métis were living. That land was already settled. So although they all lived you know, in Manitoba, uh, north of Winnipeg, uh, up to the Hudson's Bay, the land was probably in Saskatchewan and they had no way of getting there. So many of them would in fact turn that in for money. When they turned it in, they had to swear an affidavit. <clears throat> and this is an example of the affidavit. It says, I, Suzanne Sayers of Bay St. Paul, make oath and say as follows. I am a half-breed head of the family consisting of my husband and children, and I claim to be entitled to receive a grant of 160 acres of land or receive script for $160. I was born on or about the year 1833 in the parish of St. Francis Xavier. Louis Fleury, a half-breed, was my father, and his wife, Josephine, an Indian woman, was my mother. And then you can see the affidavit number, the claim number, and the script number. So if you um, are looking for resources for researching Western Métis ancestors, um, Google has, just Google, <laughs> Amazon has a number of books uh, by a woman by the name of Gail Moran. Gail has taken these, these, I've just picked these four, but there's probably about 12 books altogether, and she has taken uh, the script index, for instance, and she has put that into um, printed format. So she has gone through all of them, and it's, it really is. She's just indexed every single one. And it will give you some really um, robust genealogical information in, the, in these books. Library and Archives Canada, um, they have two series of ledgers. Uh, this is the records of the Department of Indian Affairs, and it was Indian Affairs that was responsible for issuing the script. The series began in 1872 and was kept in a red ledger, ledger with a red cover. Um, and then when that ran out, they got a new ledger and the ledger was black, thus the red and black series. 
<clears throat> so the maritime provinces were transferred to the Black Series, and that split the two ledgers into East and West, East being Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, and the West being Manitoba, BC, and the Northwest Territories. Fabulous resource for um, Métis ancestry are the Glenbow archives. Uh, those have been moved. They actually had their own archives, but that has been moved now, and they're available at the University of Calgary. So they have the Alberta Métis Association fonds. Uh, se sensitive records will be restricted um, or may be used by written permission. They also have the records of the Federation of Métis Settlement, uh, the Elizabeth Métis Settlement Association, and that settlement was about 30 uh, kilometers southwest of Grand Centre, Alberta. They also have Métis Genealogy Researchers Collection uh, and Gail Moran's uh, collection. So Gail Moran's collection you can see here uh, consists of a database of 65,434 records of persons who were Métis ancestors. Each individual, for each individual, dates and places of birth, baptism, marriage, death, and burial, and notes on sources are given. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen there uh, is an example out of the books. They have the Charles Denny Fonds there, and he really was the, um, he, he started the Alberta Genealogical Society. <clears throat> and there are 41.3 meters of textual records across 61 microfilm reels, approximately 3,800 photographs. He began doing research on his wife's family, uh, who was descended from several of the Lord Selkirk settlers from the Red River. Uh, the project grew, and by 1855, he had compiled family history files on over 1,200 families with roots in the Red River, predominantly Métis and fur trading families. Again, those are available at Glenbow Archives. And this just gives you an example of what's there. So you would go in, um, and then if it has a little um, text on the one side, it looks like a, a document that indicates that the uh, there's a scanned copy and you can click on that and actually see it in digital format. Um, they have a collection uh, showing the amount of provisions is, is issued to destitute half-breeds by the uh, Northwest Mounted Police. The table includes the name uh, of a family, the number in the family, the dates that they were issued relief, uh, the amounts of flour and bacon they were given, provisions were issued at St. Albert, Wolf Creek, Saint, Black St. Saint Anne, Stony Plain, Edmonton, and Fort Saskatchewan. Louis Riel, uh, so he was quite famous in Canadian history for standing up for Métis rights. Um, those are also available at the Glenbow Archives. The collection consists of a scrapbook of broadsides printed by James Ross, uh, essay uh, attributed to provisional government, Samuel Plunkett's letters, uh, reproduction of a letter by Louis Riel, um, copy of notices to inhabitants of Red River and Rupert's Land, genealogical data on the Riel family, their correspondence, and published collections of documents regarding Riel's life. This is a, an example of the scrapbook. <clears throat> Uh, and this is a copy of the letter, one of the letters that he wrote. I have devoted my life to my country. If it is necessary for the happiness of my country that I should now soon cease to live, I leave it to the providence of my God. They have the records for the Department of Indi Indian Affairs. Uh, they consist of diaries, letter register books, Métis who withdrew from treaty, Pigeon Lake annuity pay, uh, various invoices and receipts for supplies, beef, slaughter, grist and sawmill, uh, cash books, medical reports, and correspondence regarding the industrial school. They have the um, records for the Pacific Railway, Canadian Pacific Railway, Western Division, <clears throat> uh, and that consists of telegrams and telegraph services. Uh, Here's an example 
Further reports from the north, rebels are gathering at the south branch of the Saskatchewan, sent, sent down royal maid back to Prince Albert. It is feared an action mid-ocean when the police arrive there, which will be on Tuesday. Then we have land grants um, for the rest of Canada, primarily Upper Canada, which is Ontario. <clears throat> In the 19th century, military settling department in Quebec, under British orders, assisted new immigrants until it was disbanded in 1822. Assistance was given under the authority of Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. From 1828, the emigrant agent at Quebec acted on behalf of Upper Canada in that port. During the heavy immigration of 1831 and 1832, the needs of immigrants took up much of the attention of Crown land agents. The first emigration office was in Upper Canada, was opened in Toronto in 1833. The immigrants were assisted by the Toronto Emigrant Society, and the records are available at the Archives of Ontario. Of course, after the Revolutionary War, settling Canada became all about keeping it um, as colonial as possible. They wanted to keep it as British as possible. So there are all sorts of settlement schemes offering land in Canada. Canada is, of course, huge land mass. It's the second largest in the world. The indexes for the Toronto uh, Emigrant Society are available, fully searchable and available at the Archives of Ontario. And the online indexes give you the name, nationality, name of the ship, and the year of entry. The records themselves are available on microfilm in the archives. The first group that came out were from Lochiel on Skye. They were granted 100 acres. Sons could petition for their own 100 acres once they reached the age of 21. And interestingly enough, the area they settled was Lanark County, Ontario. In 1815, the government assisted Scottish emigrants to come to Canada, provided them grants of land in Lanark County. The first load of emigrants came aboard the ship Dorothy. The men were given 100 acres. Upon attaining the age of 21, the, the sons could also petition. The land warrants for these immigrants in 1815 are give really a listing. So this would be sort of a a recreated passenger list because it lists everybody who came from Lochiel aboard the Dorothy. The extracts give the exact place in Scotland where they came from and the ship that they sailed on. Applications, warrants and certificates of registry are all available on microfilm at the Archives of Ontario. In 1792, the Crown purchased an enormous tract of land in Upper Canada from a band of nomadic Algonquin-speaking Indians for a thousand pounds. By 1826, 2.5 million acres of the land was sold to the Canada Company for a whopping 2.5 million pounds. Really quite an incredible profit. The Canada Company was the brainchild of John Galt, who was a Scottish novelist. Galt had been hired by a group of settlers in the Niagara area who wanted to be compensated for the losses that they had sustained during the War of 1812. Despite strong connections to the British halls of power, he was not able to pry loose any money, but his efforts did give him the idea for the Canada Company. The Canada Company assisted emigrants by providing good ships, low fares, provisions, and tools as well as inexpensive land. The company surveyed and subdivided the massive Huron track. They built roads and mills, schools and homes. So you can see there it's 2.5 million acres of land. It's north of Lake Erie, south of Lake Huron and encompasses lands east of Lake St. Clair. It covers what is now parts of Perth, Huron, Middlesex, and Wellington counties. In the early 1840s, 998 Highland Crofters left South Uist and Bembecula and emigrated to Middlesex County, settling on the Huron track. The settlers were attracted by the prospect of owning land, an opportunity not afforded them in Scotland. The land on the Huron track comprised some of the richest and most fertile farming country in Ontario. 
The largest group of settlers along the Huron Tract were from Scotland. In 1833, there were about 685 people living on the Huron Tract. Six years later, by 1839, the number of settlers had risen to 4,800. The earliest township records are for Godrich and Tucker Smith, and they date to 1835. Land in Gray County, also part of the Huron Tract, started being settled in 1852. Land records for the Huron Tract are available at Archives Ontario. This actually says the Library and Archives Canada, uh, but I just recently um, had a, a comment from somebody who I'd given this information to and I went looking and they've transferred to the Archives of Ontario. <clears throat> As I said before, there are all kinds of emigration schemes to keep um, people, to keep Canada British. Regardless of which colonial scheme they came with, the rules were fairly much the same. Entire families would be brought out together. They had to have able-bodied men or women of good character. They could not exceed a, a specified age or have families exceeding a specified number of children. The potential emigrants must possess a specified quantity and description of clothing. So they would be given a list of provisions that they would require for the first year and they needed to fulfill that themselves. Families were required to pay a deposit anywhere from one to two pounds, depending on the society, uh, for adults and 10 shillings for children. People exceeding a certain age would pay more. Now, remember I said in the last slide that they could not exceed a certain age. That was for the primary uh, emigrants. However, so long as there was an able-bodied couple, they could bring out their parents, but they would pay more than the one pound uh, for their parents. They had to prove that they had exhausted every other possible means of getting money. Um, and only after they had proven that would they, and that they hadn't been successful at getting money, would they be allowed to have the aid. The trustees or owners of the properties from which they departed would be expected to pay one third of the sum. And in the Emigrant Settlement Act, there's actually a provision for the landowners to seek a loan or a grant to cover this amount of money for their um, tenants to get on a ship and head to Canada. Any sum that was advanced to the emigrants had to be repaid to the society. So basically it wound up that they paid one third, the landowner paid one third, and the um, society, the emigration society loaned them the last third. With building the railroad, land in the West opened up and that opened up new opportunity for settlement schemes and colonization. We're heading West, we're heading West to prairie land, sun-kissed and blessed, to Crofter's Trail, the Crofter's Trail to happiness. And I'm not sure any of them look particularly happy. The British and Canadian government co-sponsored settlement in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. That attracted uh, settlers from Lewis and Harris. Unlike settlement grants in the Maritimes, Ontario and Quebec, these grants came fully stocked. While the grants in the East came with uncleared lands, the grants in the West were systematically settled. The Canadian Agricultural Coal and Colonization Company show this quite clearly. So remember I had said that they came from perhaps the highlands uh, and they, which was you know, open, sparse, very rocky, relatively barren, and they come over into a forest. Um, and it took a couple of years for people in the East to really get going and be able to pay back any of the money that they had borrowed. So, you know, it took them, I remember doing a family history book uh, for a family whose uh, ancestors were um, part of the Selkirk settlers that had come into Prince Edward Island in 1806. Uh, and they had come from Collinsey. And I was able to read letters that they had sent to family. And it talked about them spending their first winter in a teepee. I cannot imagine spending a, a winter in Canada in a teepee. Um, and you know, it was, I mean, it'd be like a tent city, right? But still, so and they would, so they came, they stayed in this tent city while the land was cleared. They worked together. One of the things that was really unique about the Highland Scots in particular is that they came as groups. So um, they came already with their support system. Uh, they people that came with them, they already knew, they worked together, uh, they lived together, they spoke the, uh, Gaelic, they were of the same religion. And so, you know, it really was um, 
easier for them in terms of not feeling homesick or wanting to go back. But it also was easier for them because they all worked together as a community to clear that land. They, you know, they didn't have bulldozers the way we do today. They had to use axes and get rid of all of those um, very mature trees in those forests. And once they got that cleared, then they could build their home and then they could start to, you know, put a barn in, put livestock in, uh, sow grain. Um, and because, you know, that was so that would probably be the second year that they were here. Um, and then it would be that fall before they were getting any harvest back in order to sell and uh, make money to pay the rents. And so the um, people who were helping to settle the West decided we're not going to go through that. We're not waiting two years. We're going to have everything ready for them so that they don't have to spend the first two years dithering around trying to um, get themselves situated. The Northwest Company was probably the largest um, land grant company. Uh, it, and this is not the same as the Northwest Company that were the fur traders. This is a completely different uh, company altogether. This was a land settlement company. They provided 11 settlements in the provinces of Manitoba and Alberta. These were 30 miles apart from each other and they extended all the way along the Canadian Pacific Railway uh, line at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. Essentially, it encompassed the area between Brandon, Manitoba and Regina, Saskatchewan. Each of the 11 settlements comprised 10,000 acres. In the center of that were 640 acres that had to be dedicated to a village. So that included shops, a school and a church. And you can see, you know, they advertised quite extensively. Each person who agreed to settle on the lands was granted 160 acres uh, that they, uh, these are the um, conditions. They had to commence residence within six months of arriving in Canada. So if they arrived on the East Coast or they arrived in Quebec, they had six months to find their way out to uh, Manitoba or Saskatchewan. They had to settle the land and stay on it for three years. They could not be absent for more than six months without the permission of the Department of the Interior. Once they had fulfilled their agreement, they could purchase an additional 160 acres of land. So each settlement had to dedicate 640 acres to develop the village. Each farm was fully equipped and revenue bearing. Each farmer paid hundred pounds and that really just sort of um, was what they would put out for that first year of provisions. They'd be given the checklist, they had to provide all of that themselves, and it amounted to roughly 100 pounds. And then the Northwest Company loaned them 192 pounds. By fully equipped, they came fully fenced. There was a farmhouse with furniture, stables, a barn, cattle, and sheep sheds. They were also revenue bearing. They had 50 sheep, five cattle, one mare, and one sow. The philosophy for success was the to prevent any one family from feeling isolated. Families and neighbors could emigrate together. They would be surrounded by their kith and kin, and that enabled them to carry on their customs, their traditions, their culture, and their language. Records for the Northwest Land Company are on deposit with the Glenbow Archives at the University of Calgary. Then we have the people who came involuntarily, the British home children. 100,000 children between the ages of eight and 15 were sent to Canada to work on farms between 1869 and the Great Depression. The idea behind the scheme was to alleviate the number of poor and destitute children who were living in workhouses where they were separated from their families. The youngsters were transferred from the workhouse to the children's homes and then from the children's homes they were sent to Canada to work as indentured servants. So it really was, you know, you had all of the all of this land was being granted out west. The, the farmers were in need of labor and so these children were in need of somewhere to settle and they were sent out to to be the servants. The girls worked as domestic servants and the boys worked as farm laborers. Very young children uh, were often adopted out to families in Canada. Children as young as six might be uh, sent to work on the farms. 7,000 of the 100,000 were from Scotland. The idea of sending the children to Canada 
was pioneered by two Scottish sisters, Louisa Burt and Annie McPherson. In 1870, Annie bought a house uh, with a large workshop and she turned that into a home of industry. The poor and destitute children could be fed, they could work and they could be educated. She soon became convinced that the real solution for these children was for them to go to Canada where they could have more opportunity for a better life. While she was the first, she was not the only person exporting children to farms in Canada. Other Scottish sending homes were Woodwells uh, in Stirling, Quarriers at Bridge of Weir. Just a word about Quarriers. I've had a couple of tour participants who have had ancestors that were at uh, Quarriers and have gone back to visit and the people there couldn't be more helpful. They are fabulous about connecting people to their, uh, the history of their ancestors. Uh, Martha Frew's home in Dunfermline, Aberlour Orge, the, or, Aberlour Orphanage, the Glasgow Juvenile Delinquency Board and Girls Industrial School at Mary Hill. Those children were sent to St. John, New Brunswick. Wellington Reformatory School in Penacook. Uh, some of the boys were sent to Canada and settled on farms in New Brunswick. Emma Sterling was part of the Children and Leith Children's Aid and Refuge Society. Those kids went to Hillfoot Farm in Aylesford, Nova Scotia, and then had the Craigie Lynn Boys Farm near Paisley in Scotland. So if your ancestor came as a British home child, there are extensive records available. And those are all available on Library and Archives Canada. You will get the um, list, their ship list. You will get uh, inspectors reports. Um, and then you will also get them, you could track them through the census records. Uh, British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa has an index on their website, and uh, it basically is the same as what you'll get at Library and Archives Canada, but at Library and Archives Canada, you also get the documents. And then the Genealogical Association of New, uh, Nova Scotia has a PDF, which is the files for those kids who went to um, Hillfoot Farm in Aylesford. And with that, I'm done. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, just a couple of things while you're putting your questions in the chat box. Um, I am going to be giving a presentation for the Glasgow and West of Scotland Family History Society on January the 11th at 7.30. And it will be an in-depth look at some of the websites that we've talked about in this talk. That includes Library and Archives Canada. Um, it includes the Glenbow Archives. Uh, it includes Canadiana, on Canadiana Online and also the... Um, heritage which has uh, documents on there as well so again that that's free um, and you can watch for more information about that i also have a conference that i do uh, regularly uh, it was i was doing them every year i had enough interest this year that i've actually split it out into three the first of those will be on november 28th um, and we have uh, gillibride mcmillan is going to be giving us a gallic lesson uh, Professor Marjorie Harper is talking about voices from the Scottish diaspora, and I listened to that um, presentation. It was incredible. Lorna Steele is with the Highland Archive Services, and she is going to be talking about uh, the documents that they have. Uh, Sandy Thompson will talk about the emigrants who left Cromarty. Alison Diamond is the archivist for the Duke of Argyle, and will be talking about the Argyle Papers. Paul Nixon works for Find My Past, and he is the British Army Specialist, and he will be talking about Scottish regiments. And then we're going to have a virtual tour of Edinburgh and the um, Jacobite uh, history in Edinburgh. So that is at genealogyvic.com. There is a fee for that because I pay my speakers. So again, we can go back to any questions. Do you want to come back on, um, Claire? Hi. Uh, yeah. That was fascinating, Christine. Was that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the range of records is just out there. I mean, yeah, it's really fascinating. It really is. I mean, yeah. I've gone into Canadian research, but it tends to be more recent, you know, not as far back as, as what you've been looking at there. Well, considering yeah. that Canada didn't become a, com a country until 1867, you know, to think that there's records from the 1700s is pretty incredible. Yeah, you know, we're yeah. such a new country. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, it's funny what you say as well, because I mean, I think we all, when we start your family tree, you have this romanticized idea of, you know, the family leaving Scotland for a better life. 
but then the thought of getting all that way and then having to basically clear all the land. Um, I can't, I, I'd, I'd have yeah. swum back. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh, yeah, it would be exhausting. I think it'd be a a bit of a shock. <laughs> Can't imagine. Can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. But no, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I think there's quite a few questions um right. in the box. Let's have a look. So Susan is asking through DNA, I have identified a Scottish couple as my paternal great great grandparents. They actually came to Toronto by way of several generations, probably in Northern Ireland. They arrived in 1836. Any suggestions for researching in Ireland? In addition, yep. they had eight sons, yep. <laughs> one of whom was probably my grandfather's biological dad. I have all the relevant BMD uh, for that family, no record of my grandfather's birth. Where can I get online info on the eight sons? So were they? where were they born? Were they born in Ireland or here? It doesn't really say. Um, I think I think it looks as if they may have came. They may have been Scottish and gone to Canada via Ireland. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on where they're born, I mean, if they're born here, all of the vital statistics, other than the census, so the birth, marriage, death, are available at the local archives. Uh, the lo sorry, the provincial archives. So. Uh, you know, if they were born in Nova Scotia, then it's the Nova Scotia archives. If they're born in Ontario, it's the Ontario archives. If they're born in BC, it's the British Columbia archives. That's where you'll get all that stuff. Okay, there you go. Um, Helen's asking, can you tell us something about the Lanark societies? Um, they seem to be a, to be a co-op money saving group for immigration. Um, they operated in the Dumfries area of Lanark, Dumfries area. And they settled in Lanark County from about 1820. Yeah, so there's actually a very fabulous book that I'm going to bring. It's 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 in my suitcase waiting to come to the Lanarkshire Family History Society. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the Lanark Society Settlers. Um, it's available from Global Genealogy, and I will get that link to you, Claire. Yeah, um, that's but again, it's lots of really good genealogical information. They've got it all lined up. So, okay. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Lorraine is asking, is email the best way to reach you? Do you have a website? We will send um, Christine's website out with the pack that will come along with um, today's talk. Yeah, um, the easiest way though is just to email me. And I'll, so I'll, I'll send my email address as well. Okay, there you go. Um, someone's asking is how much is your conference on the 28th? Uh, so let me figure this out because it's... <laughs> I'll tell you exactly. It's 79 Canadian dollars. So that works out to be 45 pounds. That's not bad. No. And the, so all of it is pre-recorded. The, so we'll put them up um, and then the uh, presenters will be live to answer questions. And then there's access to the recordings for six weeks. All right, that's quite good. So you can go back and visit them. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> yeah, especially. Well, the... you know what? I think too because there's lots of time. Like there's six time zones in Canada. Yeah. So you know, it's it's one thing for me in Ontario to be up at eight o'clock, but that means somebody out west has to be up at five. So you know, I've just said just watch during waking hours and go back and watch the other stuff later. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So. Um, so Helen has said that. Uh, thanks very much for the information. She's saying about her on track. I have ancestors who left working land in Ayrshire, previously Dumfries, and immigrated to Tuckersmith about 1820. You mentioned the records from 1835. Any suggestions if I could find records that early? Uh, no, but I would, so the, um, for Tuckersmith, I think, that, is that Huron County? I would check with the Huron County branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society. Um, Claire, I can send you that information as well. Okay. Um, just, yeah. I, you know, it, it, I mean, you, you know, it's 10 pounds for, to join the Lanarkshire Family History Society. Here you have to spend uh, $61 to join the main branch and then the, you know, the provincial branch and then the individual branches. It drives me insane. Uh, but I would reach out to them, contact them and, and whatever information they have. They may charge you some nominal fee, but it certainly is worth it. Yeah, I think I got a family history society um, in Canada to do a few lookups for me. 
and it worked yeah. out maybe about you know 20 or 30 dollars or something like that so you yeah. might think just to get them to do a few lookups might be cheaper than yeah. joining yeah yeah um so patricia says i have scottish ancestors that settled in zora and yeah. ontario in late 1829 1830s with the last name of sutherland should i assume they came from sutherland in scotland uh, I wouldn't guarantee that. It's possible, but I wouldn't guarantee it. <laughs> I would say look up um, the Sutherland surname. Um, a good book to look up for that would be Black's, um, Robert, what's his name? Black's Surnames of Scotland book. And it gives you a good idea of, you know, where the earliest mention of a surname is in Scotland and what area of Scotland it came in. Um, Barry is asking, will the website information given in the presentation be sent to us by emails? Yes, it will, Barry. Um, whatever email address you've registered for the talk, you will receive a pack which has all the information. Um, Kathy is asking, she's Irish ancestors, mid-1830s, crossed from New Brunswick across CA to Washington Territory. They may very well have used some of these resources to find this presentation very interesting. Any further insights? No, but that's actually not uncommon because after the Revolutionary War, um, Britain stopped most travel to um, America. So a lot of, and we didn't have a hard and fast border. I think it was 1872. So, you know, it was dead easy. There were frequent passages over to Canada. So people would come over to Canada and then just make their way into the States with, without any qualms at all. So that's, I mean, that's really very, very common. And you have them coming the other way as well, uh, where they would have come from the, uh, they may have been living in the States and then after the Revolutionary War, they came up. Yeah, okay. Um, Bob has said there were thousands of Highland families going to the Maritimes in the 1800s without any livestock. So where did they acquire their livestock? And then he said, secondly, for information, Carolyn McIsaac has written, All Alone Again, the story of one of the British home children, Joe Payne, who was sent from England to my great grandmother's farm in Cape Brenton, or Breton? Breton. Breton, yeah. Yeah. Some of those sad stories are incredibly sad. I know, um, do you know, it, it's actually made me think when I heard about it, about looking some of them up actually I think it might be a bit of an eye-opener mm -hmm. yeah um so what was the first question oh about how did they where they get their livestock um yeah. it, it was, it's quite possible that they would have just got them here um you know the northwest company and the hudson's bay company had them out west so they could have been shipped from there they could have been shipped from the states um yeah uh, and then the last thing we've got is Lorraine has said, thank you, Claire. Um, she's the 84th chief of the New York Caledonian Club, as well as she's the trustee of the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, a Canadian and British citizen to boot. Terrific session and much appreciate this. Very good. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's really nice to, to, to well, never get meeting you really enough, Lorraine, but um, yeah, <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> I've I saw somebody in there too said that their ancestor was with the Hudson's Bay Company. So I wondered if they were with Orkney. Ah. Do you know, it's funny. I went to a place called Barrisdale, which is out on the West Coast. And it used to be a little settlement. And it was cleared during, the, obviously, the Highland Clearances. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people actually died, you know, in that area. And they, they have all these graves which sit on the beach. And apparently ships came into this loch. It was a sea loch. And these um, ships came in there and took, you know, passengers off to Canada. Yeah. They just, you know, they've obviously there's, went um, to the Highlands. There's a group that, that came in from Lewis <clears throat> into um, Bruce County, uh, which is, um, it's about two hours north of here. It's on Lake Huron. And um, they, the, so it's, there's a monument in the middle of the town, uh, town of Ripley to the Lewis settlers. And they also have uh, the old pioneer uh, cemetery, but it's along the river and most of the monuments have fallen into the river over time. Just yeah. sad, really. Yeah, that's quite sad. Yeah. Um, but yes, so thank you very much. I think that's all, let me just double check. Oh, Métis ancestors through my Orkney three times great grandfather, fabulous. 
Yeah, um, Lorraine's also said she's got HBC Orkney men on her dad's side. They landed in James Bay in 1773 and her mum was actually born in the UK. Your oh. family are so well travelled. <laughs> Do you know, um, so uh, just an interesting thing from the clearances, uh, there was a, a family who were cleared from Rogart, uh, the McDonald's, and they wound up going into Glasgow and okay. then they came over to um, Canada and their son was our first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Oh. There was another uh, family who were in Halkirk up um, in Caithness and uh, they were cleared and they came over to Nova Scotia and they were the Keith family. And he started the one of Canada's um, famous breweries so the uh the keith alexander keith beer and then the um another family was cleared uh from kildonan uh in sutherland and they came over and they were coming over to work in the uh, not to work in the hbc but to settle on the red river and the boat took them way to the north in churchill so they wound up there was about 750 miles that they had to walk to get to where they were going I can't imagine. I mean, they're either hardy or stupid, right? Um, and so one of the men, he, um, when, their, when their spirits were getting low, he would play the bagpipes uh, to keep them going and to keep them marching forward. And their, gra their grandson was the one that was a, a prime minister of Canada as well, the Diefenbakers. So just amazing some. Yeah, I mean, I think they were so much more resilient back then as well. As well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I often wonder um, Canada gets so much, you know, more snow than, than Scotland does. But I often wonder how they adjusted to that and the fact that they had to stay in teepees. In a tent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, Annette's just put a message in the chat box saying, worth mentioning that Ontario East British home child family were very helpful in tracing British home children. Yeah, there's a number of groups that do that will assist with British home child uh, research over here. It's um, we we actually had a it, we had the year of the British home child a few years ago, and there's all kinds of uh, it's it's actually quite fascinating. There's one out in uh, Nova Scotia, and there's several here in Ontario. I must have, I think they would probably be quite busy. <laughs> yeah, as an organization. Yeah, they are. All right. Okay. Very good. So I will, and I'll leave the question and answer on the recording. Okay. Um, so because some people might also have the other, might have similar questions, and that'll, and there's might be resources in there that they would want to look at, um, and I will get that off to you uh, within a couple of days, and you That's can great. send out the the list. Yep. The other thing as well is that I've actually been speaking to Christine about doing a. A Facebook live chat for my Kilted Ancestors group on Facebook um, regarding sharing ways to share your family stories. History. Your yeah, family yeah. Stories, yep. So that so could involve, yeah. Lorraine, uh, Lorraine who uh, has the uh, Metis, I didn't know this actually, Lorraine, thanks for this. It, she says Christine might be interested in knowing that Dan Aykroyd, who was a an actor here, Donald Sutherland, also a Canadian actor, and James Belsilly, who was the founder of Blackberry, are all Métis from Manitoba. I did not know that. That is fascinating. Every day is a school day. <laughs> it is, eh? <laughs> the day's not been a total loss. I, lo I learned something today. <laughs> I know, I know. You should add that in at the end of that presentation now, Christine. <laughs> I'll have well, to thank go you. Read. I'll thank have to go and so rework much. it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very thank good. you so much, Christine. Right. And See thank you, you for everybody for attending as well. Bye. Bye.